Hi, my name is Wouter Emery and I'm the founder of AirShaper. In this video, we'll explain how you can measure the aerodynamic drag of your road vehicle using coast down testing. Now, the principle of coast down testing is fairly simple. You're going at a constant speed with your vehicle and then you engage the clutch to let the vehicle slow down. By monitoring the distance covered over time, you can then calculate the mechanical resistance and the aerodynamic resistance. Here's how it works. In a very simplified form, the car is slowed down by just two sets of forces. The mechanical forces, mainly consisting of the rolling resistance of the tires on the ground. This is a constant force, which means that it doesn't change in function of the velocity of the vehicle itself. And then there's the aerodynamic forces, which actually do scale with the square of the velocity, meaning that they're very unimportant at very low speeds and very, very, very important at high speeds. Newton's famous second law states that the acceleration or deceleration of an object is directly proportional to the sum of the forces acting on it. Applied to our simplified coast down test, this results in the following equation. For the mechanical resistance, we've limited ourselves to the rolling resistance, which is calculated in this case by multiplying the coefficient of rolling resistance, CRR, with the normal force of the vehicle on the ground caused by its weight. As you see, there's no velocity term in this one. And then there's the aerodynamic resistance, which also contains a coefficient, CD, which is the drag coefficient. And this one is multiplied by the density, which is known, by the frontal surface area of the vehicle, which is also known, and, importantly, by the square of the velocity. So how do you extract two different coefficients from a single equation using just one measurement? Let's look at two extremes to understand how this works. One extreme would be to do a coast down test on the moon or in the vacuum hyperloop tunnel of Elon Musk, where you would have virtually no aerodynamic resistance. Your deceleration curve would just be a linear one. On the other extreme, you could eliminate the rolling resistance by mounting your vehicle on magnets, like a maglev train, for example. You would only be left with the aerodynamic resistance, meaning that your deceleration curve would be highly non-linear, with a steep drop-off at the beginning and a very long tail infinitely long tail before you come to a standstill. In reality, your measured curve will be a combination of both and will lie in between those two. And you can play with the two coefficients, CRR and CD, to make your measured curve match the predicted one. This is a process called least squares regression. In the end, you will know both the mechanical resistance and the aerodynamic resistance of your vehicle. Sounds easy, right? Well, it's not that easy. First of all, the mechanical forces. In reality, the rolling resistance coefficient CRR isn't independent of velocity and does vary in function of speed and in function of the road conditions, the road surface conditions on the test track. Also, there's mechanical resistance included in the drivetrain components like the differential, the bearings and so on, so you'll have to add more terms to the equation. Secondly, there's the aerodynamics term, which is also much more complex than what was presented. First of all, manufacturers may present CD values as standalone static numbers, but they do actually vary in function of velocity, as the Reynolds number changes. Also, you'll need to compensate for changes in ambient conditions, like temperature, humidity and the density of the air. And then there's the wind. As soon as you have wind on your test track, the vehicle speed no longer matches the relative wind speed to the car. So you'll need to measure the relative wind speed on the car itself by attaching a measurement probe to it. And, as the wind can also come from the side, you'll need to measure the angle of attack of the wind as well, to compensate for that in your calculations. Thirdly, the terrain is not always flat, so you'll need to add yet another force term to compensate for the changes in potential energy, as the vehicle goes slightly uphill or downhill. At the other end of the equation, treating the car as a single translating mass is also not adequate. Even though the clutch is engaged, there are still a number of rotating components, like the wheels, the brake disc, the shafts, and so on. And they all have their own rotational inertia, and this needs to be compensated for as well. Sometimes, this is done by virtually increasing the mass of the vehicle itself. And that's not even the full list of things you'll need to compensate for, for a good test. So as you can see, this can quickly become very complex and prone to errors. Nevertheless, this is one of the default methods prescribed in many norms to determine a vehicle's performance, like the WLTP, SAE norms and so on. But there's nothing stopping you from trying this yourself, using your cell phone, GPS and a good bit of magic in Excel. I hope you liked this video on coast down testing, if you did, click the like button and subscribe, and I hope to see you soon for more. Thanks for watching, see you soon.
Bye-bye.